Good afternoon. We have a few more people coming in, so we'll wait just another minute before we get started. Good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Courtney Neubauer, and this is our September monthly call. Hopefully um, most of you had a long three-day weekend and were able to relax some, but now back to work and back to a new month. Um, now that we're what I consider fall, I'm not sure in Louisiana if we're quite there yet, um, but this is absolutely my favorite season. So hopefully it's all of yours as well. So we don't have a whole lot of um, really large updates with program operations, but uh, a lot of reminders and, and other deadlines and things that are coming up. So today we'll talk about online applications, the reimbursement rates for school year 22-23, pandemic EBT, and also the local level funding that will be coming very soon, the possible COVID specific waivers, other flexibilities that may be available for school year 22-23, e-scholar and CEP manager uh, and training updates and then other program reminders. So to start the online application, this is due. It has been due for now a couple of weeks. So we um, extended the deadline initially to Friday, August 26th. That has passed. Um, we are now in September. Uh, the forms that need to be submitted mainly are the ch policy checklist, Schedule A, collection procedures, collection officials, labor expenses, and income and expenses. Uh, if you do not intend to use any waivers, and at this point uh, we are not expecting that there will be any waivers that need to be utilized unless there are true school closures, you do not need to submit anything with the waivers. Additionally, there are some um, issues with importing PEP data this year. So we are asking you to continue trying to import that information. If everything comes in as zeros, you can then make adjustments on the income and expense um, to accommodate the, um, the, income, the expenses related to labor. Uh, I do have a question in, in chat about when the applications are going to start being approved. They are being approved, so we are approving applications daily. We, when we receive applications, they go in order of receive. So we start dispatching them to staff to be reviewed, and they go down the list. So the oldest applications are reviewed first, and then the ones that have come in later are going to be a little bit further down the to-do list. We are trying to move as quickly as possible to get those reviewed. The, uh, if the applications come in and, and everything is correct, those are easier to, to move on. Most of the applications that do come in, there are errors or discrepancies or a lot of the, the documentations are not correct. Uh, the attachments are not correct. So then we're having to reach out to the school food authority and that definitely slows down the approval process. If you do submit an application as it's being reviewed, if there are errors, you're gonna be contacted by email or phone. Please make sure that you address those as quickly as possible. If you do not submit the required documentation, um, then the application will not be approved timely and it, may, it will prohibit you from submitting your July and or August claim. So you cannot submit your claim for reimbursement for program year 22-23 until the application is approved. So the sooner you can get it in, the sooner it can be reviewed, the sooner you'll have access to submitting those claims. The reimbursement rates for school year 22-23, these reimbursement rates are higher than they've been in previous years. This chart 
reflects the rates that are good for July 1 through June 30th, um, 2023. These are the rates that we are currently utilizing. There have been some questions about um, if you paid attention to the Keep Kids Fed Act, that there was some additional funding that was put into the reimbursement rate. That's included here. So everything that you would receive on a per meal basis for lunch is listed here. Um, all of our school systems are um, is eight cents certified. It used to be six cents certified, then it was seven cents, now it's eight cents. So um, you're either going to be in the less than 60% free or reduced or the 60% more, and you're going to be with that eight cents. The breakfast rates are listed here as well for um, the, the increase in reimbursement is included here as well. Remember that that eight cents that we saw for lunch, it's not included in breakfast. So these um, re reimbursement rates are a little bit simpler. You're either severe need or non-severe need. And that's done on a site level and um, the reimbursement rates are based off of that. The snack rates are also here. They are higher than we've seen in previous years as well. Um, just refer to this if you're looking for what the reimbursement rates are. Uh, it's a standard rate this year. So whereas last year we saw that there was the special rate, this is, this is the total reimbursement per meal for breakfast, lunch, and snack um, under National School Lunch School Breakfast Program. Pandemic EBT and local level funding. Summer PEBT is underway. So all students in K-12 schools are eligible for summer PEBT if they received free or reduced price meals and were in school in May of 2022. So you had to be enrolled in school and you had to be eligible for free or reduced price meals. If that child was eligible, then they are um, eligible to receive a payment of $391, which was divided into two installments. The benefits have started to be issued. So some of them went out very late in the summer and more and more are being distributed now as school systems submit those files of students that are eligible for payment. To be eligible for PEBT, students had to attend school at least one day in May of 2022. If they did attend school, they need to be in a school that participated in CEP or qualified themselves for free or reduced price meals under National School Lunch School Breakfast Program. And this includes students who may have received benefits in, during May of 2021, and also other students that may not have received benefits yet, but were eligible because they were enrolled in school or attending a CEP school in May. The summer files need to be submitted to the PEBT admin portal. The deadline for submitting the files is September 23rd. So the files were able to be submitted on August 29th and they are still being accepted. So please, if you haven't submitted those files, get those in. Families are talking to their friends. They know when somebody else has received these benefits. And the sooner we can get the spreadsheet in to DCFS to have those benefits issued, um, the easier you'll li your life will be with phone calls um, that are coming in from families asking about the benefits. They're running the files pretty regularly. So um, they are issuing benefits. They're going to run the spreadsheets for that are issued for June, um, actually, today and then they'll be available starting tomorrow and then they'll continue to do collect the data through September and then also in October. Future issuance for PEBT if there is something for this school year will be announced in November. So right now the last issuance that we're working on is the summer PEBT benefits and those we expect to continue through September and, um, and into October. Submission deadlines for the 2021 PEBT, those need to be submitted no later than September 23rd. They're not going to be able to submit any information um, for benefits for school year 2021 after that date. Submission for 21-22, 
Those are going to close on September 23rd, and there's going to be a new process that will open up starting in November. And the plan is to close out all of the submissions for school year 21-22 by the end of the calendar year of December 31st, 2022. You can update addresses within, within the portal. So if a family contacts, um, fills out in the parent portal that they have an address change, those will go to the um, to the school system or whoever's reviewing that, and they can review that address change and make sure that that information is correct and that the card will be reissued. The data managers can complete all the tasks that they need to do within the portal when there are changes to, um, to student information from the households. If someone needs access to the administrative portal, the information is here. You need to contact dcfs.pebtsupport at la.gov, and they're going to ask you for a very specific name, um, your ID, your, your LaGov username, your email address, and other information that you are that you use to identify you, and they'll give you access to the portal to be able to submit and review information. Still get a lot of questions from families about PEBT fund expungement. So all federal benefits that are issued, including PEBT, um, have a nine month time limit for use. The timer is reset to nine months each time a purchase is made. Families were sent letters to inform them that the benefits would be soon expiring. If they make a purchase, the timer resets. If they don't, the benefits are lost. The card and case remain active. So if there are future benefits, they'll be loaded on the same card. And then um, that, that, that same nine month time limit will um, exist. We are, we are receiving inquiries regularly about fund expungement. Once the funds are expunged, there is no way to get them back on the card. So um, if, they're, if they're calling and asking, the way to handle this is to use the card and then um, the clock resets. There are weekly office hours that are Tuesday at 10 a.m. There's also the data manager toolbox. If you need access to that, you can request access to that. And then um, other links, PBT website, the parent portal and contact information to reach DCFS if you have any questions. Coming soon, so in addition to the benefits that are issued directly to families, USDA has made funding available to all operators of the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program that were responsible for activities related to fiscal year 2022 PEBT deliverance. FY 2022 PEBT are activities that happened anytime between October 2021 and September 2022 in conjunction with PEBT benefits that were issued for school year 21-22 and then summer 2022. So the work that we're doing right now uh, is still summer 2022. So those are the activities related to this PEBT local level funding issuance. We will award a specific dollar amount to all eligible entities based on the number of PEBT eligible children. So this is the same process that we use for fiscal year 21 PEBT. You're not required to do anything. You do not have to submit an application to receive the funds. Um, we will just automatically send those funds to your account, the same account where you received your, uh, your re reimbursements for meals served. We expect that this will happen um, in the next coming weeks. So I would expect in September, we will see that those payments are issued. Possible COVID specific waivers. So these are the waivers that are currently on the online application. And these are waivers for non congregate meal service, parent guardian pickup, meal service time, and offer versus serve. These are not nationwide waivers, nor are they to be utilized uh, regularly. So these are basically to be used as kind of a safety net. So we're gonna save them and use them 
for instances when co uh, congregate feeding is limited, so if there's a school closure or some other um, change in the, the trajectory of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that we have these kind of in our back pocket to use if needed. They are meant to be for a safety net only. So if there are COVID cases that are spiking, then we are able to use those and they are only approved for short durations of time and we will be basing approval on specific criteria related to COVID instances. So if there's a specific school closure related to COVID, then um, that would be something that we may be able to utilize these waivers. But in general, there is no need to submit any waiver requests for this school year at this time, unless you already um, have some kind of school closure. We are not approving these for future yet use, so they are here for a safety net, but the districts are not to submit requests um, with thinking that they're going to need them down the road. So um, we've left them open, so if you do need them, you'd have access to them, but at this time you do not need to submit anything unless you have a specific closure. The waivers that are available, if it if we need those, we have non-congregate meal service, which this waives the requirement that meals must be served in a congregate setting. The parent guardian pickup, this waives the requirement that meals may only be served directly to children. Meal service time flexibility, so this waives the requirement that set meal time parameters for school lunch and school breakfast. Offer versus serve waives the requirement to serve school lunches to high school students using offer versus serve. And these are all effective until June 30th, 2023, but only in instances when congregate service is limited because of COVID. So we're not approving these for blanket situations. They're very, very specific, often um, down to the school level if, if there is a particular closure. So um, very, very seldomly to be used. There's also some waivers related to fresh fruit and vegetables. Should there be closures at a site that is a fresh fruit and vegetable site? We have parent guardian pickup there. We also have the ability to serve fresh fruit and vegetable at an alternate site if there's a closure at a fresh fruit and vegetable elementary school. These are also uh, effective through June 30th, 2023, but only in situations where congregate meal service um, is limited because of COVID. We also have a suite of waivers related to anticipated school closures. These are the types of waivers that we typically request um, when we have natural disasters like the flood of 2016 or hurricanes where these types of, um, of flexibilities may be needed. USDA did allow us also to elect these unanticipated school closure waivers should the situation arise where there be um, closures of schools, especially for more than just a few days. I'm hoping that we don't need this uh, at all this year and that we will not have any long-term unanticipated school closures. There are also waivers related to CACFP. And that's the non-congregate meal service, parent guardian pickup, the meal service time flexibility, and also the on-site monitoring requirements. So this waives the on-site monitoring requirements and allows for monitoring through off-site means. Um, these waivers are also only for specific COVID instances and not to be used uh, across the board. Additional flexibilities for school year 22-23. We do have a nationwide waiver that is in effect for school year 22-23. This is the only nationwide waiver in effect for school year 22-23. And this waives the fiscal action um, for meal pattern violations that are related to supply chain disruptions that may impact school systems. So this applies to national school lunch, school breakfast, and is available for any situation where a supply chain disruption happens and you may be having an administrative review. So if there are any situations where meal pattern violations do occur, documentation to support what happened and why it happened and how it's related to the supply chain disruption um, will protect you in, um, from fiscal action penalty in those types of situations. There are a few more school year administration related flexibilities. So the local wellness policy triennial assessment that 
change the, the assessment deadline to June 30th, 2023, instead of June 30th, 2022. Food service management company contract duration. This permits school systems to extend their contract um, that were not otherwise eligible for extension, and they can do that through June 30th, 2023. The Administrative review on-site requirements. So this excludes the on-site monitoring requirements and allows for off-site processes. And this is effective through June 30th, 2023, but should only be used if it is needed. There are other flexibilities related to paid lunch equity. So this waives the paid lunch equity requirement for school year 22-23. And this pertains to the school lunch prices that you are setting for school year 22-23. The carryover eligibility, there's been a lot of questions about carryover eligibility. So if a school operated seamless summer in school year 21-22, they can use the most current recent free and reduced price determination since 2019-2020 during the first 30 days carryover. And this is effective for the beginning of school year 22-23. Most of you are probably still in that 30-day carryover. There's also flexibility for determining severe need reimbursement and the two cent differential for national school lunch and school breakfast. And that's for both this school year and next school year. Little information about the Medicaid demonstration project. So as you know, we announced that Louisiana is one of the eight states selected to participate in the expansion of a demonstration project. This is to begin in school year 22-23, and we will have both a free file and a reduced file, and that information will be loaded to eScholar. We're using the same process that we've used before, and you will have two separate files to download, one for free and one for reduced. As you all probably know, there was an error that was noted in the Medicaid file that was loaded in late August. The file has been removed from eScholar Direct Match, and a new file is intended to be loaded in the next few weeks. Um, I hope by the end of this week, honestly. If the school system was really on top of things and they downloaded the file, please contact your food service software company. They can um, help you reverse the import. So the new file, when it is released, will take over and be the, um, the status that should be given for these families. Um, and the import that was already brought in should be reversed, if at all possible. As a reminder, students that um, that are reduced price through Medicaid, if there are, if they have been directly certified for free meals through SNAP or TANF, and or they've been identified free through an application, those that status of free should take precedence over the reduced price meal. So students should not be um, be penalized and be given reduced price benefits when they should be receiving free benefits. If you have a household who does qualify for reduced benefits, you are required to send those households a notice of the income, income levels so that they have the opportunity to apply if, if their income meets the qualification for free meals. Under the Medicaid demonstrations, children are not considered to be categorically eligible, so they can only be direct certified through, um, through the um, automated data matching system. So households are not allowed to handwrite the Medicaid number on the application, so that's why there's not a box for them to handwrite that in as there is with the SNAP number. So that is not considered proof of eligibility, so they need to, um, submit, they need to, it needs to pull in on the direct certification file to qualify. As I mentioned earlier, students already certified for free or reduced price meals that are based on an application or direct certification with another program cannot be neg negatively impacted by the matching with Medicaid data. So if the local education agency has determined that a child is directly certified as reduced, and the child is also determined to be free through some other means, then the child should be free, and, and that should supersede the Medicaid reduced status. eScholar updates. 
So the July SNAP and TANF files have been loaded. I expect that the August files will be very soon. So hopefully we'll see that in the next couple of days. The population data for CEP has been closed. So at this point, what you were needing to submit is going to be the elections. So the elections are due by September 30th. We still have a lot of school systems who have not submitted their, um, their, their data for the, pop, the CEP, CEP elections. So do make sure that that gets in by September 30th. If that's not in through eScholar, then the school system would, um, would not be eligible for CEP for school year 22-23. So do make sure that that is submitted. Training updates. So we do have some upcoming trainings for September. So registration is open for all of the September trainings. Uh, we also have the registration for the October trainings now available on Louisiana Fit Kids. Our next monthly call is Tuesday, October 4th at 1 p.m. So that's next month. But in addition to that, the September trainings that we have. So tomorrow we have the nutrition support office hours at 1 p.m. This is a time for you to bring your questions, comments. Um, if you have anything regarding um, CEP submissions, Medicaid, uh, administrative review, whatever it may be, you can bring those questions. There's no, no, no agenda. So it's really an opportunity for you to ask any questions that may be coming to mind. If you just wanna come listen, that's fine too. Um, so if you can come and just listen or if you have questions, please do so. We also have a training on September 15th on verification. September 20th on meal claiming, since we'll be getting to the point where submission of claims will be, be coming in. On Thursday, September 22nd, a training on whole grains. And then on Tuesday, September 27th, we have a training on the NSLP equipment grant. We do post the agendas and the registration on Louisiana Fit Kids. The training slides and recorded videos are also posted to Louisiana Fit Kids once the trainings are complete. We also have a few um, trainings or meetings that are coming up at the end of September. So we have two days full of, of in-person training. So on Wednesday, September 28th from eight to one, there is the farm to school gathering at Pennington. That afternoon, from 1.15 to 4.30, we have our state update, which is an in-person meeting at Pennington. And then we also have, on Thursday, September 29th, an all-day childhood obesity conference. We have put out um, a memo to try to explain this, since there's three different conferences happening over the course of two days, but all of the registrations are available on Louisiana Fit Kids. Other program reminders. So as a reminder, um, the proclamation for procurement where the suspension of the public bid law allowed for emergency procurement that ended back in March. Um, I, I know at this point we're in September and you're probably wondering why I'm still reminding everybody of this, but this is something that is still uh, something we're seeing. So do remember that procurement, suspension of procurement standards uh, is no longer waived, so you must follow the state procurement law. There are still some flexibilities when it comes to state law um, for procurement of agricultural products and in support of farm to school activities. FSMC contracts, the deadline for charter schools to submit their food service management contract was June 1st. I know this is still after June 1st, but if there's any food service uh, school system who has not submitted their food service management contract, uh, you cannot claim meals for the school year or even in July, which is already passed, um, if, if the approved contract is not in our office and approved by us. 
have some other additional funds coming in. So the supply chain assistance funds this is considered a second allocation of the funds that were released previously. So this has been announced. They're going to be distributed by us, the state agency to the schools. Um, and they are going to be used to purchase domestically grown food products for your meal programs. We have completed the calculation. Uh, it's using the same calculations as we did in the, the previous allocation back in December of 2021. We also can use the same attestation statement um, that was received back in December of 2021. So we will not be com collecting additional uh, attestation statements. Everything has already been received and that these payments I would expect to also go out sometime in September. Once they do go out, we will post that on our website and we'll send a blast out so you'll know what memo, what line to look for on the, the payment so you can identify them as the supply chain assistance funds. As a reminder, I know this has been coming up a lot and we're already in September. So I'm hoping that just that nobody is, is still under the assumption that meals are all free to all students, but there are no free meals to all students during, um, during the school year. So it has not been extended into the school year. Families need to submit free and reduced price meal applications unless the school is a CEP school where all students do qualify for free meals under CEP. Please make sure you're accepting applications um, and communicate this to your families often. They're probably not used to paying. Uh, they haven't had to pay for two years. So as many reminders as you can regarding the, um, the, the, the re reversal of, of going back to where it's free and reduced priced meals as we've seen um, for, for many, many, many years. As I mentioned about the training on the upcoming trainings, we do have the equipment grant that will be coming very soon. So we've been awarded $521,000 to be distributed to SFAs participating in the National School Lunch Program to purchase equipment. Schools approved for participation in the National School Lunch um, that participated in Seamless Summer um, or SFSP as part of the flexibilities are still eligible to apply for this grant opportunity. Priority is given to schools where the greatest percentage of enrolled students are eligible for free or reduced price meals. And we, um, the schools that are eligible will, will, will be able to submit an application. If you have a school that has already received a previous equipment grant, that school is not eligible as there are still many, many schools that have not received an equipment grant um, yet um, in the many years that we've been doing this. The application period is tentatively scheduled to open on October 3rd, so just less than a month, and it will close on November 4th. There will be more information once it is open uh, and also the training later in September on how to complete the application. Turn up the beat. So this is an award that is presented by USDA that recognizes outstanding summer meal program sponsors. This is any summer meal program sponsor is eligible to apply the to apply. They must submit the turn up the beat nomination form and a one month menu. Please, 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 if you know of any great program that had an, a wonderful summer operation, we encourage you to nominate them, even if it is yourself. Um, so that we can get someone from our state represented, represented as being awarded this honor by USDA. Had about four or five questions um, of regarding the, the small purchase threshold. Um, so I'm watching the chat box and there's been multiple questions regarding this. So um, I said it was kind of like Christmas in August. So we, we found out about this in August because it, it went into effect on August 1st. So on May 31st, Governor John Bell Edwards signed House Bill 221 at 204 into law. And this increases the micro purchase threshold at the state level from 10,000 to 30,000 and the small purchase threshold from 30,000 to 60,000. So this raises those thresholds, making it um, 
where there are probably more item, more more uh, purchases that'll fit into the small purchase threshold and micro purchase threshold. Therefore, um, re re relying more of quotes um, or, or spreading the wealth for those types of purchases versus um, formal bidding. So this was this is something that should make your lives a little bit easier. Um, normal purchasing guidelines regarding quotes are still required for those small purchase purchases, and this went into effect on August first, twenty twenty two. Our new school nutrition program spotlight for this month is Ms. Wanda Deemer. She has been employed by West Feliciana School District for 26 years. She's been working in food services for more than 15 years as the child nutrition program assistant and a cafeteria manager. She loves feeding the children and it shows in her dedication and hard work. She's a firm believer that every worker should follow all the policies and procedures. And we are very thankful that she's gone above and beyond for the students in West Feliciana Parish. We're still taking recommendations for program spotlights. So the summer food service spotlights is what we're still trying to focus on as we move into the school year. Um, we'll start to see more of the, the spotlights related to school side, but as we're still closing a lot of the summer, um, our minds may still be on summer vacation. So um, you can send those that information to Kathy Carmichael to be featured on here. I have a good bit of questions that I'm gonna to try to answer. Um, I've already mentioned about the applications that we are approving them as they come in. So please make sure that you're submitting it. It is. Uh, approved in the order that they're received. Make sure that the applications are as correct as possible. The uh, When there are numerous errors or we have to wait on additional documentation or files to be sent, it slows down the approval process. So do make sure that the applications are complete. Check over your average meal cost and make sure that you've updated that information to the current year. That is one of the main things that we're seeing. In addition to the attachments that are coming in, making sure those are the current attachments that are coming in with those those, um, those forms. So the Schedule A, when you're attaching the wellness policy and the procurement plan, making sure that all of that is the most current and up to date for the school year. And there's questions about the Medicaid files. So um, as, as I've mentioned, if you contact your vendor and they can um, help reverse the file, um, if you don't use software and you can manually make those reversals, I encourage you to do so. We do expect that a new file will be coming very soon. And once it will, those statuses will, um, will take over for, um, for those children that did qualify for free or reduced price meals. Okay, there's a few questions about the, uh, the change in the procurement threshold. So as we mentioned, the micro purchase and the small purchase thresholds have been increased on the state level. So that is, in, um, that is very beneficial for all of our school systems um, as more often than not, it's the state restrictions that have kind of um, dictated the thresholds for our, most of our school systems. Um, so that increases those thresholds, making it a little bit easier for micro purchases and small purchases. The turn up the beat um, is it's it's representative of summer 2022, and this can be either for SSO or SFSP. So if you have a recommendation, please um, do please bring that um, send that to us as soon as possible. We'll look at the rest of the questions. Uh, 
Um, there's a question. If you are district-wide CEP, um, the only thing that will contribute for identified students when it comes to Medicaid is the Medicaid free. So once those files are available, it is going to be the, um, the Medicaid free that will be considered directly certified. So your Medicaid reduced will not be considered directly certifi certified or they won't, be a, a, they won't be identified students for the purposes of CEP. So they'll be directly certified for reduced meals, but they will not contribute to that identified student percentage for CEP. So it'll only be the free that will impact the identified student percentage. Okay, when, when applications are approved, uh, there's an automatic email that goes out and it goes out from, um, it, it's the eml.svr, it's, it's kind of that generic email address that, that, you, that most of our blasts come from and it'll tell you that your application has been approved. So we automatically send that to the um, authorized rep and the superintendent listed in the, the child nutrition website. I'm not quite sure when the Medicaid file will be available. I hope that it'll be later this week, but it may not be till the first part of next week. Um, and there is a reminder that do make sure that your um, small purchase, micro purchase thresholds are not um, lower than the state level um, on, your, on your school board level, or you'll have to revert to following those more restrictive um, uh, restrictions on procurement that are dictated by your, your school board. Okay, there's some questions about the, um, the change in the procurement standards um, on the state level. So if you, um, if you have a, a more restrictive school board um, threshold, you need to follow that. If you are a charter school, you are following the federal thresholds, which are not, have not been changed um, recently. So they are not impacted by this $60,000 or $30,000 change. Um, the threshold for small purchase for charter schools is $250,000. Um, okay, if you have any specific questions related to your specific situation, you can call, um, call me or email me and we can talk through those. If you want to come tomorrow to the office hours from one to two, I'll be happy to answer any additional questions related to program operations, if it's situations regarding the Medicaid file or CEP or administrative reviews. Um, we do, I know I don't have a slide about administrative reviews. I'm, I'm about ready to, to send that um, to most of our school systems. Um, but we have not, um, we don't have the exact dates for most of the reviews. I know many of you, um, about probably 10 or 12 of you have received emails from me that your reviews are scheduled for September or October, and you will um, be getting additional information from CN Resource when that review is scheduled. We do hope to have an entire review schedule for all reviews that will be this school year, hopefully by the end of this week. We're going to post that to the website. I'll also be sending out emails to all the schools that are scheduled for a review, just to remind you that you are up for review this year. Um, we are in the New Orleans area. So this is the review period. Um, that we're in the New Orleans area. So do make sure 
that um, that if you have a school in that general area, New Orleans, um, St. Bernard, um, all of that area that kind of surrounds the New Orleans area, that is the area in which we are we're doing reviews this school year. As a reminder, if there are any new school food authorities that um, have not already that are new for this year, then you are not six cent, seven cent, eight cent certified, whatever you want to call it. So the menu certification is not complete. Uh, so do make sure that that is submitted so that will hold up approval of your application. If you are a new school system, you need to make sure that you're submitting that um, menu certification. If you are a returning school system, please do not submit the menu certification documentation on the website. That is not for returning. It is only for the new sponsors that are new to child nutrition this year. So anybody that's not new, please don't submit your menu certification through the website to us. All right, are there any other questions? Must have talked faster today than I do normally. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, if not, I hope to see some of you tomorrow on the office hours, and then also hope to see many of you at the in-person training at the end of September. And then again, um, for our virtual monthly call in October. <laughs>